remember, we have a motto for last uh, uh, IGF in Poland, which was Internet United, and hopefully through this session, we will try to understand the ways that we can actually keep Internet as it is united and hopefully to see how can we face all the different actions that perhaps may affect um, Internet as it is right now, knowing that there might be several actions that perhaps could actually split a little bit Internet. So um, we are, as I said before, with uh, great uh, many esteemed colleagues now. We will start, hopefully, if uh, we can try to see if we have Mr. Jovan Kurvalija online. Can we please see if we have him? Just let me know uh, if you have uh, in the chat your name. Well, I'm not sure he is joining so far, but we will be alert in case he is joining. Okay, so we will go with our second uh, participant, Mr. Timothy B. And I would like uh, to ask him a couple of questions, please, so he can develop as well as the other colleagues during his intervention. So my first question is, uh, how fast, sorry, just one second. Well, where the spread of instant content blocking and content filtering could lead the world and how to find a balance between fact checking and digital discrimination. You have to know that um, our speaker is a representative of Russian based think tank NO, N -A -N -O, sorry, dialogue. Uh, Mr. V is particularly known as an expert in fact checking and fake information. That's why we want him to um, cover a little bit of this particular subject. And besides this, we would also like to know what impact can internet fragmentation have on user experience aside from constraining certain uses of the internet to create, distribute, or access information resources. Please, you have the floor. Because it's well, where you sit is too far away from the screen and it, it may be blocked. Come on, come on, come on. Come here. That's okay. That's totally okay. Come closer. Yeah, yeah sit here. So, fighting fakes. Uh, my organization, and a Dialogue, is a think tank and inter ministry coordinator for fighting fakes and disinformation in Russia. And we have experienced a lot of kind of battles in information war during the COVID and during the uh, those things happening in between Russia and Ukraine now. And this is the thing I wanted to focus and to develop a story on. So far from the 20, can I please have my presentation back? Thank you. I don't see it. So far from the 24th of February, yeah, so far from 24th of February, we have detected 3,603 fake narratives, fake stories. So each story is like sub such a separate subject describing some fake narrative. All this 3,000 stories ended up in social media and messengers and they turned into almost 9 million social media entries, posts, messengers and so on. Do you wonder how many views did it get? Almost 18 billion views. So like 17.5 billion views 
of fakes and disinformation among Russian social media and Russian social networks. That do look, does look like a problem, like a big problem for our society because the end aim for all of these fake stories was to disrupt our society, to distress it, to make people panic. And sometimes our opponents succeed, sadly. But <coughs> we have developed a system which does effectively fight this kind of informational attacks. I should say that this kind of attacks are coordinated. And I'm going to show you some examples of fakes which uh, we have been finding and monitoring. So, say, uh, there were a lot of fakes about war or special, special military operation. You can pick the name that fits you most. For example, uh, there was like um, pics with uh, military vehicles and caption uh, said that Ukrainians captured Russian vehicle, but after our, in our investigation showed that this was a still uh, from the, f uh, this was a Photoshop still from the 2009 video and somebody just Photoshopped uh, Russian identification tag to make it look like it's a Russian vehicle, but it was not. This was interesting. Uh, sadly, the part of the screen is blocked, but it says here MCS Russia, which is stands for Russian Ministry for Emergencies. And somebody up, somebody set it up a fake Telegram channel, pretending to be uh, an official ministry Telegram channel with some information. And it says that dear citizens, Wiberg and Karelia are transferred to Finland instead of Finland joining any military blocs, meaning NATO. That's an uh, interesting story. Thus, too, energetic system will be switched to Europe European Union from the 18th of April. Uh, it's obvious that it's fake, but still it was disseminating in the Russian social media and especially in between uh, citizens of Wyborg or and St. Petersburg. And the aim of this fake was very obvious, to make them frightened, to make them panic, to make them distress. And um, I can say that this is kind of um, informational terror. Step by step, they uh, fill our social media, and not only our social media, but informational landscape with this kind of disinformation stories, and there are lots of them. So, for example, but not only, this kind of stories happen not only in Russia, but also in the international media landscape. I want to show you the <laughs> video from Israel Channel 13 which try to show some consequence of military fight. Here it is. Uh, we look for the video and somehow in between clashes and some garbage we see what? Strange, yes. How the Star Wars intergalaxy fighter did up end up there? Curious. Uh, but sometimes media can, of course it is a, it is a mistake. I don't know why it was done, <laughs> maybe it's a stupid mistake, but sometimes media make some really bad mistakes which are, uh, I can't even describe it because, for example, once the Italian media La Stampa published this picture of crying man in between debris on the street and La Stampa said this is a man who was uh, shocked and who was injured by a Russian attack in Kiev. But in reality, this man lives in Donetsk. Now it's Russia. And this is a photo from Donetsk after the explosion of the Ukrainian r tactical rocket Tochka U, which landed in the city center and killed 20 people. So actually, media took a s picture of a crying man from Donetsk who was uh, injured by a um, Ukrainian rocket and published it as it would be a man standing in Kyiv. That's totally not correct, but the point is the last Tampa never excused for that. Russian, uh, not Russian, sorry, Soviet plane and 225 Maria. The well-known plane sadly destroyed. And the Ukrainian media and Western media immediately blamed Russian Federation for destroying this aircraft. 
in the airport of Gostomel. But if you check the satellite pictures, you can see some Russian military trucks near the plane, near the hangar for destroyed plane. And what's interesting that almost immediately after the plane was destroyed, the Ukrainian, I don't know her exact like state, but uh, Ukrainian deputy and some military advisor, uh, we can't see her, we can't see her, <laughs> her name sadly, published a photo from the drone, from the aerial drone of the hangar with a um, frying plane, with like a plane catched on fire. And she said that lightly armored vehicles, being these supply vehicles and Russian personnel, and uh, were destroyed at Gostomel airfield by Ukrainian artillery. So, sh so by this, she actually proved that the Gostomel airport was shelled by Ukrainian artillery, and the Ukrainian army were those who destroyed this plane. Uh, obviously, she deleted this post like in a few minutes, but we still have a screenshot. Last story about Poland, maybe you have heard that. A rocket, sadly, hit the Poland territory, destroying a tractor and killing two civilians. Almost immediately, the scattered debris from the rocket was published, a pic of this debris was published by Poland media, and our experts made a quick investigation just to find that this is a part of rocket from the um, air defense missile system S-300, which is, which is used by Ukrainian to defend its airspace. Moreover, this part of Poland is far away from any point uh, from which Russia could actually fire that kind of missile. But what, who do you think was blamed for this kind of attack and f for the deaths of these two civilians? Of course, Russia. Uh, next day, a couple of, not a couple of, almost all the Western media published stories about Russia attacking Poland. And Russian missiles hit Poland, Russian bombs hit Poland. You see, this is disinformation, this is fakes, and none of this media never excused for, the, for this fakes, for this disinformation campaign against Russia. Even Joe Biden said that this was Ukrainian missile, but and but Mr. Zelensky still insists it was Russian. Anyway, uh, how to confront this information? We have developed a system which consists of four basic steps. Hmm. <laughs> we have con d uh, developed a system which consists of four basic steps to confront disinformation warfare. First of all, is monitoring and detecting suspicious messages. Second, verification, because we need to know if this message is fake or not. We have to verify it, we have to fact check it. Mr. Preparation we will of have just uh, some seconds to continue, maybe we can go again. I'll I can speed up? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, sure. Just, just one minute, please. You can, you can have one minute. Ah, I have, it. okay, sure. Please, just to wrap up. So, preparation of refutation and delivery, because delivery is very important. Lastly, I can. Uh, I wanted to get. I want to back. Uh, I want to get back to fragmentation, uh, because we had a story with Facebook and Instagram, and Facebook and Instagram were social networks with advertisement system through which our opponents distributed fakes through advertisement. I mean, like through the paid messages, like this, like this, like this, and finally, like this. This is an actual screenshot from an advertisement which was ran over Facebook targeting Russian audience. I have a uh, very easy question. How the hell is it possible for that message, for that picture with a corpse lying down to pass the moderation system of Facebook? Answer is obvious. They had a kind of shortcut for doing these campaigns. And finally, Facebook did nothing to stop it. Actually, it was <laughs> that's why it was banned in Russia. Um, but no, yes, they did once. They did one thing. They modified their policy, allowing they modified their policy for Facebook and Instagram, allowing users in some countries to call 
for violence against Russians and Russian soldiers in the context of the Ukraine invasion. This message was published by Reuters, uh, who, g who took access to some internal emails for Meta. Um, I want to finish on that, that we are speaking about fragmentation, but I think we should focus also on big tech and platforms who should not abuse their big, very big power and very big audience for some political reasons. Because if they do abuse, our country has a full right to protect our digital sovereignty and our people. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. B. Um, indeed, there were shocking images and uh, of course, we may think about different examples all over the world with this kind of manipulation of information, of images, etc. So it's really, really shocking. And since this is happening in all over the world now, our next presenter, Dr. Ikchen Chin, um, an associate professor in a school of journalism and communication at Beijing Normal University. She's also an esteemed expert in internet governance, digital policy, regulation and law and digital e ethics with a particular focus on China. So, uh, Dr. Ik Chin Chin, can you please tell us how should we approach internet fragmentation? Should we perhaps prioritize the content and transactions layer first or speak of the more technical network layer? And the other question I would like to cover is uh, what threats do the technical, legis legislative, and policy developments being made in recent years pose to interconnected and interoperable internet? You have the floor. Okay, first of all, thanks for inviting me to join the panel. And uh, it is uh, my pleasure to address these two questions. So um, first of all, uh, we got into the first question. Uh, about uh, whether we should approach the internet fragmentation from the content layer or from the infrastructure. So there's a two, point, uh, two points I want to make. The first one is about, um, uh, uh, personally, I think there's also not uh, only, uh, there's a, a kind of the similar argument has been put forward by many academias, uh, also the IG organization that uh, uh, we have been talking about the concept of public core of the internet for many years, especially uh, by like uh, the global commission and the stability of the cyberspace GC. Because this is the organization who put forward this concept of public core of the internet. So, uh, public core of the internet, including, like, uh, for example, the uh, backbone, uh, also the network layers, uh, naming system, like uh, uh, IP address and uh, domain names, and also like uh, other other uh, other. Uh, other uh, stand, uh, uh, the standards, you know, and the encryption mechanism, even the transportation of the contents. So those we call the public core of the internet. So for those public core of the internet, it should be, you know, free from the state's interventions and it should be kept uh, always global connected, interconnected to maintain the internet's stability and the safety. So in in that sense, I think many of our colleagues and uh, me as well uh, wants to enhance, you know, and at least to build up some consensus on what does the public cause, you know, we uh, we mean, and how can we build up uh, this? Uh, first of all, we need to agree the scope of the public core. Of course, different organization, you know, put forward a different uh, uh, scope of the public core of the internet. It can be included, as I said, the backbone, uh, live layers, and the standards, or the naming system, okay? And then the second question is, so first of all, we need to have a consensus and the scopes of the public core of the internet. And the secondly is, uh, how can we uh, build up a mechanism, you know, mechanism to uh, implement to protect the public core of the internet. So who should be the, uh, I don't know, the institutions, you know, to monitor, you know, to protect the public core of the internet if there is uh, disruptions, or if there is uh, interventions, uh, interference to uh, disrupt the public core of the internet. So that's why I said uh, uh, to maintain the uh, connectivities of the internet, first of all, we need to start from the, uh, infrastructure level and uh, also the standards and naming systems, okay, and even the uh, uh, 
sometimes application A as well. Uh, but so in the end, we probably have to rely on the uh, continuous discussion on the concept of the public core of the internet. Okay, so this is the first point I want to make. The second is about uh, the content layer, uh, content level. Um, I think uh, uh, in terms of contents, because the content is a very big uh, uh, area, so you know, it can include uh, different uh, uh, contents, for example, polygraphies, uh, crimes, online crimes, cyber crimes, hate speech, and also uh, different like uh, defamations, you know, all these uh, belongs to content layers. So therefore, I think uh, for some contents, for example, like this disinformation, hate speech, polygraphies, you know, so we can have uh, like a global uh, framework because there's some um, minimal agreement, minimal common standards, you know, we can build up some uh, international initiative to tackle this information, for example, disinformation, polygraphies, children, online children protections, you know. But for other contents, for example, um, let's say, which is relative to cultural uh, uh, sensitivities, uh, contents, uh, uh, I would uh, suggest to leave it to the individual con uh, countries' jurisdictions, because each country they have a different jurisdictions and they have a different uh, regulations, legislations in terms of how do they uh, regulate contents, specific contents, you know, in related to their traditions, cultures, uh, sometimes religions, you know. So in that, therefore, some contents we can have a minimum uh, global standards. We can have a global initiatives, you know, like uh, many countries already have the uh, kind of initiatives, established initiatives. So, but for other countries, which we can leave to individual countries' sovereignty and to the jurisdictions. Okay, so this is uh, my uh, response to the first questions. So the second question is about, uh, uh, is a, uh, sorry, just a moment, I have to. The second question is about uh, uh, some other areas, uh, for example, what, what, what threat do the technology legislation policy development being made in recent years opposed to the uh, interconnection and the interoperability of the internet? Uh, first of all, I think there's uh, three points I want to make. First of all, it's about uh, geopolitics. So we have been seeing, you know, in recent, uh, I mean, at least five years, last five years, we can, we can see the, the geopolitics between different countries, China, Russia, uh, America, you know, has become the, one of the most important uh, threat to the internet connectivities. I think uh, most of us agree that, okay? So this has become the most important uh, threat, I think, uh, to the interconnectivity and the interoperability of the internet. Uh, for for example, uh, one of the examples, because uh, I, I'm an expert doing the, uh, in terms of digital trade and uh, transport, uh, uh, cross-border data flows, okay? So for example, if you look at uh, the digital trade agreements, you know, we saw there's uh, many different uh, uh, free trade agreements uh, in terms of the, how do we do the digital trade between different uh, countries? So obviously also there's uh, uh, some of the FTAs are formed uh, align, uh, in line with the uh, trade box, you know, for example, there's a trade box uh, among the developing countries, OECD country, and there's a trade box in terms of Asian, Asian, Asian countries. Uh, there's a trade box between the, uh, I, mean, I mean, different, uh, uh, different regions. So this actually become the uh, kind of the, uh, I think, uh, 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 obstacle to establish the global uh, connectivities and also the interoperation of operability of the digital trade. So this is just one of the example. Of, co of course, there are many other examples. And uh, the second one I would like to, and the other example is uh, uh, we all see there's a um, tension, you know, we, we can see the uh, digital code word between China and America. So there's a, we we're talking about the uh, technology decoupling, you know, and the disruption of the global supply chain of the IT industries. So this is also uh, caused by the geopolitical tensions. So this is uh, also very important important uh, force in terms of the threat to the internet connectivity and the global internet network. And the second thing I think I, I would like to talk about is the weaponization of the internet. So because uh, from the very beginning, the internet is, is free from the, you know, the cyber war, this kind of thing. But in recent years, we, 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 we can see there's an increase of the discussion and uh, also kind of acceptance, you know, uh, of the cyberspace become a war zone of different cyber attacks, different cyber war, you know, are happening. And the people increasingly to accept this is kind of uh, normalized, okay, normalized, uh, we call the weaponizing of the internet, the cyberspace. 
And the third one, uh, the last one I want to say is, uh, which is uh, quite a concern from my point of view, is we call the privatization of the internet governance. What do we mean by privatization? Because when we say that uh, internet governance, we know it's a multi-stakeholder you know, model of, of the governance. And one of the most important uh, governance uh, stakeholder is the private sector. Uh, besides the governments, we, can have a, we have a private, uh, private uh, stakeholder and uh, governments. So, and, uh, so increasingly, we, s we see the uh, private sector has been play more and more important role in governing the uh, internet, for example, like uh, our, uh, our colleague just mentioned about uh, the big platform like uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Google's, you know, as well as many uh, like backbone suppliers, uh, the level operators, they are all private uh, actors, but actually they are doing the uh, internet governance, you know, they can block internet access. So this kind of does, uh, uh, actions, for example, one of the recent examples is the Ukraine war, you know, we, we saw the uh, several American-based big uh, like uh, backbone suppliers, you know, cut access from the Russia uh, to, uh, the, uh, to block the, uh, the uh, internet access from Russia to the global internet. Uh, of course, this is, a, we, we say this is a kind of private san sanctions, you know. And the problem is that I'm not arguing that this is right or wrong in terms of the uh, normality, you know. Uh, but uh, my argument is uh, wh where is the accountability and the transparency? So if they can decide it uh, to block this country's access, that country's access, so and where, wh how can we hold them accountable? So when and how can they make the whole po blocking process transparent, you know, accountable to the public and to the individual in that particular countries as well. So therefore, you know, some uh, the many organizations like uh, uh, technical community like ICON, uh, Internet Society, and also human rights uh, organization that actually stand up to against this kind of privatization of the internet governance. So therefore, I think uh, we also need to uh, uh, think about you know the the private uh, privatization of the internet governance. How can we make make them more um, accountable and transparent? So therefore, to maintain the trust among us, you know, when this happened, not only the people in Russia worry, uh, w was worried, and many people in other countries, for example, the public uh, and the network operator in China or in other many other countries are worried about it. one day this may happen to them. You know the private uh, the backbone big backbone international backbone operator can simply cut your country's assets. So this is terrified. Many other countries, uh, governments, the fundamental mind trust among us and also the stability of the global internet connectivities. I think that's all I want to say. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chen. Actually, very, very deep reflections from your side. Thank you very much for those. And I think now we have uh, Mr. Jovan Kurvalija uh, online. I will ask, please, the uh, technical support to give him authorization so he can uh, open his mic. Um, well, we all know Mr. Kurvalija. He is an esteemed expert within IGF community, founding director of Diplo Foundation. So I would like to give him the floor, please, now. Are you with us? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm Fantastic. Uh, here. I'm sorry for this delay. I'm very friendly to, to Geneva on my flight from Addis. And uh, uh, we are in a, I'm now connected, if you can hear me. Uh, I will start with a, just a few points. With the risk that I will repeat what was already This very connection that we know uh, in Addis and me is facilitated by cables. And I come from the submarine cables, if you can see from the background, uh, two connections from Addis via Djibouti to the rest of the world. This is the point on which our discussion starts. And we always forget that uh, internet infrastructure, while it is decentralized uh, in its uh, uh, system, its security, 
ISP, it is very centralized when it comes to uh, submarine cables and uh, telecommunication infrastructure. With something like we calculated 24 critical points. One of them is Djibouti, definitely. Uh, I won't go in that direction, but there is a need for serious discussion how to protect this critical infrastructure. There was a Dutch proposal to consider it as a global public good. There were proposals 100 years ago to consider uh, telegraph cables as, as neutral in the case of the war. All of these proposals were dismissed. Today we have law of the sea convention, which is basically have some provisions and protection, but we have privately owned cable with very little uh, public uh, legal uh, protection and in a, and with very powerful uh, technology, submarine technology, which can cut cables in no time. This is a huge vulnerability. Now, this is the first point. The second point is that we should be proud on one point, that in spite of all tensions between countries and worldwide, internet is still one of few infrastructures that functions across the divides and borders. Today, it's possible to send email from St. Petersburg to, to Kyiv. Uh, it's possible to exchange messages across different uh, conflict divides. Well, obviously, on the different layers, the situation becomes much more uh, difficult. Therefore, this is the second point, which I think we should cherish, and sometimes we should be uh, proud and acknowledge uh, robustness on the governance regime. Third point that we should keep in mind is that internet is global in its technical infrastructure, but it is very local in its impact. Therefore, impact of the internet on society, when it comes to culture, economy, other issues, uh, should, uh, should be reflected also in governance regimes. Uh, it would require definitely diverse, uh, um, diverse uh, architecture in governance regimes and things are changing uh, um, in especially around the data around the question of data governance data sovereignty and i was uh, surprised a few months ago when i saw advertisement in the economist and you as you know economist argues for the free flow of data advertisement for the training uh, for the workshop on data sovereignty supported by google and I did a little investigation to see what is the thinking concept behind it. And you can see that companies are adjusting to this reality that uh, governance has to be somehow localized and adjusted, adjusted to local specificities. There were three points for my um, uh, statement. The first one, we should be aware, we should follow the packets and be aware of the basic vulnerabilities that current internet has, and it is related to submarine cables. Uh, the the second point is that internet infrastructure is robust and it still functions across the different divides. And third point is that internet is global in its technical functionality, but very local in its impact on society, economies, uh, families, local communities. And it should be reflected in the governance regimes. Obviously, easy to say as a notion, difficult to achieve when it comes to pra practical regulation with all the risks of fragmentation, of, uh, of um, um, disintegration of economic space, uh, civic space, and we can elaborate more on it, but those are my three points. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jovan. Um, great speech as well. Well, now let me go with uh, Dr. Milos uh, Jovanovic. Um, he is uh, the president of OpenLink Group. And uh, doctor, he has a PhD in information security, and he's also a professor at Bel Belgrade uh, Metropolitan University. And I would like you to cover a couple of questions as well. Are the purpose of fragmentation and the steps being made towards it by different uh, players reasonable? And the other one is what possible reper repercussions could uh, there be due to the spread of instant content blocking course on political basis and intrusive content filtering. Okay, I'll start uh, addressing the first question regarding the fragmentation. So if we speak today about fragmentation of internet, we should make parallel, you know, think with real 
uh, with the real world. So we have fragmentation every day in, in our life regarding uh, economic sanctions to, to other countries which do not want to follow uh, one path of development, uh, inequality um, across the globe, neocolonialism and political you know, conditioning in all possible kinds, discrimination and uh, availability of scientific and technological results. Um, the, you know, so we have fragmentation every day. So internet as a global network cannot be out of, of this, you know. So uh, we should speak about UN Charter. So Internet Governance Forum is a platform of the United Nations. And uh, if we uh, decide to respect, you know, and to uh, respect basic principles of the United Nations, uh, we will not have fragmentation. And that's my conclusion on this question. So this is a very uh, wide topic, you know, speaking about national sovereignty and technology. Technology is a vital part of national sovereignty. Definitely, right now, we don't live uh, in, a multi in, a, in a unipolar world, uh, uh, you know, in, th in this time. So, you know, power is shifting from the west to the east, and now we have multipolar, you know, uh, world, and circumstances are pretty different. So, speaking about fragmentation, I think that we should, you know, um, that we should uh, agree on minimal, you know, uh, minimal framework, common framework of internet governance. So speaking about infrastructure, Mr. Krubalia spoke about, uh, you know, optical cables, you know, and uh, submarines, attacks, and so on and so on. We really uh, need, you know, a uh, common framework how internet will work. And speaking about uh, uh, or intranet as a local approach, so we know that uh, uh, right now we have maybe three different technological zones, speaking about maybe Chinese zone, about uh, Russian zone, about Western zone. Of course, we have some processes here in Africa, in Latin America, and so on, and so on. And I want to make one, you know, uh, example, good example. When you visit China, you will not be allowed to use some Western services like Google, Microsoft, and so on, and so on. When you visit Russia, yeah, you will not be allowed to use Twitter, uh, you know, LinkedIn, and so on, because uh, Russian law said that all the data of Russian citizens should be stored in the territory of the Russian Federation. When you go to the United States of America, Western part, European Union, and so on, you have debate about Huawei equipment and so on and so on and so on. So uh, we are now in a, you know, a very interesting historical times. And speaking about internet governance, about technology, about everything, we should cover topic about national sovereignty. Because we cannot speak about national sovereignty uh, if we don't conclude that uh, technology, right now, technology is a vital part of national sovereignty. And we attended many conferences across the globe where technology, you know, played a wi vital role of everything. And uh, now, you know, uh, we cannot say that, you know, uh, internet, uh, we, we should back, you know, to the history and we should understand how internet started in the uh, late 16 years of last century and as an ARPANET project, you know, it, it, it was about military and after that they said we should go away to one, one global network started, you know, in the last century. So now in this moment of history, it, it, work, it works, you know, now in this moment of history, uh, I think we should make another real how internet will work. Uh, in, in the future, because definitely all countries want to protect, you know, their own freedom, their own information flows as well, and their own sovereignty. And that's the question for Internet Governance Forum. So I think that we need, you know, our, uh, you know, minimal common framework, how Internet and infrastructure will work in the future. Regarding the, you know, uh, informations and the information flows and, you know, uh, your second question related to, you know, content blocking and so on and so on. Uh, moving back again to sovereignty. Every country wants to protect their own information channels. So if you say that internet is one of information channel and definitely one of the most important, every country is responsible for, you know, for this inform information flow in this channel. So speaking about special mil military operations, about different, you know, aspects uh, across the globe, uh, we experienced, you know, and we saw uh, internet shutdowns as a part of, you know, cyber warfare. You know, we saw, we can't divide internet uh, from military aspects. 
in a sound way. Of course, it's a global network. Uh, as Mr. Kurbalia said, it's the only network problem which allow us to send, you know, uh, information between people, for example, right now from St. Petersburg to Kiev or from some different, you know, uh, parts of the world. But uh, I definitely think that we need uh, to move away from legacy policy and to think about new strategies. Uh, which will prevent internet shutdown, but according to minimum, you know, common framework on internet governance. Uh, this is a multi-stakeholder forum, you know, we should speak on multi, you know, stakeholder level, definitely. And, uh, you know, imagine one situation, if we don't achieve, you know, something regarding a new strategy, regarding new uh, deal on internet governance and so on and so on. We have example, a uh, good example, uh, many people, uh, you know, which know how internet networks works. Can you imagine that if you make your sovereign internet, like I know that China did, uh, you know, and, and did this project, Russia as well, and many other countries, you can make your own internet. It's possible, you know, if someone decides to, you know, to, uh, you know, to block uh, global access to some countries like China or like Russia, or like other uh, big countries and so on, you'll be able uh, to use your own uh, intranet network and all your critical infrastructure services and everything will work. But in this aspect, you know, uh, you will be able to, to make, for example, available to your own population to access bbc.com or any other site and to get absolutely the same website, you know, but the different information. You can put some IP addresses and make host files and your, you know, population will be able. So we need, you know, a new deal on internet governance and new strategy, definitely. And th th there is a question, who can shut down internet during the, the conflicts? You know, what is propaganda? What is the fake news? Who can say what is propaganda and what is the right news? We have different aspects, you know. Uh, people across the globe think differently, you know. So I think that the main deal of new strategy of on, on internet governance should be, you know, how uh, we should deal with some, you know, uh, differences across the globe. We, uh, we, you know, see what's happening here in Africa. There are new, you know, and different process. We, 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 we know for Silk Road, Belt Road initiative from China. Uh, we see, you know, Eurasian concept of integration. We see what's happening in the West right now. So there are a lot of, a lot of many questions, you know. There are many questions right now. And so I would say that this is a historical times, definitely. And the internet, you know, as a, you know, the only global network which works right now, you know, uh, we definitely should speak about new strategy, uh, which will replace legacy, you know, which, you know, that's, I think that's why we are right now here. So uh, that's my answer to, you know, your question. And I will conclude with um, um, national sovereignty as a part of, you know, technology is a vital part of national sovereignty. And I think according to UN chapter and all, uh, you know, UN documents and so on and so on, it's a right to, you know, to every country to think uh, about, you know, national sovereignty in a field of technology, economic, uh, political, and all other aspects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ivanov. What do you think about the comments that I just tried to wrap up for the, for the end of the session? Huh? Um, We believe that Internet Foundation is something we as a national society should be wary of, especially if it, or it is a rather natural process which we have to accept. And the other one, can you envision how the Global Digital Compact or any other type of international agreement may deal with this matter? Thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor. And uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, Bonjour, good morning, zdravstvutia, dobri utra. First of all, let me thank the United Nations and also thank uh, Ethiopian government and the organizers of uh, Internet Governance Forum for giving us this platform to express our ideas and also uh, our ambition towards uh, a sustainable cyber space. <coughs> I'm also, let me express my uh, gratitude and the happiness that I met with the different friends here at this forum. 
after a few months from attending the Vladivostok Eastern Economic Forum in Russian Federation. And this, is, um, this shows that our friendship and our engagement is not fragmented. <coughs> Uh, as you mentioned that uh, Algeria Youth Ambassadors is mainly not a spe very specialized foundation in data or internet, but we work mainly on youth diplomacy and also engage Algerian youth at the local level with different uh, institutions, mainly uh, at the level of the ministerial level and also at the presidential level and also at the parliament level to um, engage more youth in the governance processes, good governance processes in Algeria. Let me mention that Algeria Youth Ambassadors is one of the consultant uh, members of the Higher Authority of Transparency in Algeria, which is a consultant uh, authority of, to the President of Republic. <coughs> And also, um, besides my uh, civil society activities, I am here working in Addis at the African Union at the Political Affairs, Peace and Security Department. And since I came here, I noticed um, that uh, we spoke a lot about propaganda since I work in the disarmament, demobilization and reintegration division. Propaganda and fake news are slowing, let me say, that are slowing the peace initiatives and are slowing, making it harder for disarmament processes in Africa. We are now witnessing also new terms uh, such as data demobilization and cyber demobilization that's still not clear for me, for example. And uh, its definition uh, cannot be controlled or defined uh, in the cyber world. Today, there may be no resource as powerful or as vulnerable as data. The central role that data sharing plays in contemporary society, ranging from use of social media to accessing administrative services, is accompanied by a high degree of risk. And let me mention that three or four days ago, my Facebook account was disabled by my meta company just because my account was hacked by other hackers who violated the community standards of Facebook. So you can imagine the damage that, uh, let's say, uh, it, it was very emotional to lose all your work that your accounts since 2010, like almost 13 years of engagement, all your network, all your family contacts, all your souvenirs were lost because you've been act attacked. You can notice from this the degree of risk you are witnessing. Also data sharing on a mass scale uh, and for many purposes in a digitally connected world means that our personal information is increasingly open to attack and misuse. In uh, our online communication and transaction, we risk exposing details about our lives that are used to be private, as a matter of course, further states across the globe are creating digital identity systems that connect to our biometric information, building a bridge from our digital activities to our li lives in identity offline. The digital identity may then become the target of exploitation either for commercial, commercial, political, or uh, sovereignty ends, as my friend Milos mentioned. And talking about sovereignty, let me mention that now we are witnessing a new sort of attacks, a new sort of threats, a new sort of wars, which is the fifth generation of wars that is mainly based on cyber attacks that attack mainly the sovereignty of the government. So, um, talking about digital fragmentation, in most cases, is based on a unilateral decision, the decision, whether between a country or another country. It's kind of like of sanctions or punishment. I don't know how to mention that. But also it can happen between a country and its population at the internal level between the government and the authorities towards the users in that geographical area of that country. Because if we say citizens, maybe there are foreigners there, there is international organization there that will be impacted. So uh, for me, digital fragmentation is a sort of violation of uh, human rights for me. 
if it is a way of imposing sanctions between different powers, let, uh, let, uh, let us remind ourselves that we are moving towards a new era of a multilateral world. This uh, multilateral and multi-actor world is indeed one of the outcomes of the UN 75 survey. And I'm sure that most of you were engaged in this survey in 2020. And also is mentioned in the UN 75 declaration. Uh, UN 75 declaration as part of the agenda of the United Nations Secretary General, His Excellency Antonio Guterres. Let me also remind everyone that the UN 75 declaration declares that the world leaders agree on, agreed on the 21st of September 2022 on 12 commitments in this UN 75 declaration. And amongst those 12 commitments, we will improve digital cooperation is one of these commitments. So um, now if the UN uh, is taking initiative to improve digital cooperation and members, or let's say member states, are uh, still in uh, that, uh, let's say, um, mentality of block, two blocks in this world. So I think you, we as youth, we still have a lot of work to do and a lot of things to advocate for. For me, it's time now to advocate for an institutionalized instrument that protects us as users and also as citizens and also as human beings living in this planet. In Algeria, let me give an example. In Algeria in 2021, we went through a sort of reforms on our national uh, referendum in 2021 on the Algerian constitution as a way just to strengthen our constitution against all sorts of discrimination and hate speech in, 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 its, in its all sorts, online and offline. So, um, uh, talking about the envisioning of uh, the declarations or uh, how you call it, uh, amend uh, the declarations or the decrees, international decrees. Let me mention that the United Nations Human Rights Council recognized that internet is a human right as part of the United Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And just like to conclude, let me say that protecting our data as users is also must be considered as, as a human right and Mainly, like we need to advocate for an establishment of an international court specialized in cyber attacks and data rights violation because defamation, blackmailing, sexual exploitation, and many other violations, hate speech, fake news, misinformation cannot only cause data damage for the internet user, user but also impact his life in reality and forever. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and uh, my pleasure for having me here as a speaker. And uh, what I want to say is, you know, with regard to internet, internet is at the first place is at the crossroads because of the fragmentation of the internet globally. So, you know, throughout. All countries of the world, we have uh, varieties of, uh, you know, um, uh, protocols, standards, and so on. And this makes, you know, um, uh, the e-commerce, not only the e-commerce, the trade as a whole, to have, you know, a kind of uh, uh, misinformed and uh, to make, you know, wrong decisions on that issues. So. For instance, currently, as uh, as AU of uh, of uh, of uh, 2063, Vision 2063 is uh, to realize, you know, SAFTA, 
African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which can be done via internet. But it is very much difficult if there is, you know, such kind of uh, fragmentation uh, throughout the continent at continental level as well as globally. So there has to be some kind of, you know, uniformity standards and protocols has to be there so that to make things, you know, on the right track and to make the business at it is is condition. So having that is uh, very much so the current condition as a whole is, you know, there is, you know, a kind of, uh, uh, with regard to fragmentation, we have uh, internet blockage, uh, filtering, censorship, and so on. These are the problems, in fact, whether it is connected with the political agenda or not. But the government, each government of uh, each country, of, uh, of uh, uh, respective countries should have their own, you know, protocols and uh, standards to have, you know, um, uh, the controlling mechanism of uh, misinformation and uh, uh, disinformation. So having that is very much important, r rather than, you know, blocking the internet. Because blocking the internet connects with the human rights as it is, uh, you know, connected with, you know, the access to information of the citizens. So this is the point that I want to forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, right now we're almost about to close the session, but first, because I would like to hear uh, any questions from the audience. I do have one uh, in the audience chat. But anyone would like to make a question? Yes. Can you make a share of what you like? Thank you, uh, Roberto, for giving me the floor. Um, I'd like to uh, thank all the uh, panelists for uh, your brilliant intervention. And um, I'd like just to, to raise another point, as um, the, we, we have uh, some kind of rules that uh, we are using uh, that was promoted, for example, the net neutrality. Uh, net neutrality imposes for every uh, telco operator, infrastructure uh, operator, not to block any kind of traffic over the internet. But the reality from the global south is that the economy of internet is um, mainly focused on the content platform provider who are located globally in the north. So when it's come on the, um, when we have to deploy to response to the end user need in terms of infrastructure, the cost remain to the local um, operator. But the economy generated by the internet as well, yes, our countries in the global south um, um, take, uh, added value on the, on the internet. But I would say that we, we have to pay attention on the rules we put on the governing the internet as infrastructure and the consequence that uh, implies on local actors. Uh, today, we, 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 we know that the major actors uh, who are controlling the infrastructure around the world can block when they, uh, we, we, we saw that we can change the rules uh, to say you can block, you can uh, stop. But for the global uh, actors, we said net, net neutrality, you need to open to keep all traffic paths over network. So I think that we, we come in an era that we need to sit together and uh, try to be, uh, if we need to, f to, to promote um, uh, sustainable internet, the quality, we need to have the same internet around the world, we need to rethink it uh, together. As a, uh, otherwise, we, we, we can think that we can get the same internet around the world, but it will not be true. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karim. Um, maybe we can have one more question for the audience. There is one there. Uh, please try to keep it in one minute so we can uh, get a couple of more questions. And after the questions, or comments, we're going to, uh, to give one minute to each panelist, so 
we can close the session. Yes, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you very much. Very interesting panel. Actually, I would like to ask uh, to to ask about uh, the layers of the internet, as you uh, uh, pointed out, that we have some backbone infrastructure uh, layer of internet, but. Uh, something that I, uh, I think has been missed from your uh, definitions of dif internet layers is the role of the platforms, transnational platforms, that they are to some extent now parts of the uh, uh, internet infrastructure because they are internet gatekeepers now. And uh, the role that they are playing as a, 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 a transnational global regulators of the internet by not only by promoting something that you called it as uh, social or national sensitivities, also by blocking something that is against their corporate rules. That corporate rules now is global rules for the internet. And it's something that we need to think about, the role of the transnational platforms as part of the internet infrastructure that we need to come up to some kind of the uh, global universal protocols that all of them they need to comply with. Thank you very much. Uh, is there yeah, there is one more in the audience? But before going that, I will read one from the chat. Thank you for your speech and examples. However, now we see the ongoing process of fragmentation and the degradation of the common digital space. The key challenge is lack of practical steps to prevent fragmentation of the internet. What international platforms for making practical decisions on this topic, in your opinion, can help prevent internet fragmentation in the current situation? And that's related with the other one regarding maybe the, the, the future global digital compact. We have your intervention. And after that, we will give the floor to okay. our panelists. Uh, thank you. My name is Ashanafi here from Ethiopia. Uh, thank you for giving this chance and thanks all who is preparing this uh, forum, which is very inclusive forum, and uh, welcome to in our country, Ethiopia. Uh, my question is, as you listed out uh, in your presentation, the information destruction is uh, hiding the truth. Uh, even if, uh, rather than it affects the social, economic, and uh, political concerns of the people, it hides the concerns of the science, or it hides the uh, uh, the truth uh, because of disrupting or hiding or misleading the right information. Uh, when we see in our country, Ethiopia, most people are not connected into internet, but uh, the media or the researchers. Uh, concerned or gathering information from uh, some amount of people which are connected to internet. But there is a lot of idea, a lot of experience, a lot of information or wisdoms from the unconnected uh, peoples. So, do you have any plan or looking out to reaching out the unconnected people's idea or experience or exposures. This is my question. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And now we start with uh, our panelists. We, we can start with uh, our left. Yeah. Mr. Wako Aduna. All right. Uh, Thank you for the questions and suggestions. Uh, you know, with regard to um, addressing the internet, I think there has to be the infrastructure that has to be in a place, um, whether at national level or, or uh, globally, because we have to have, you know, a kind of um, infrastructure investment that has to be there so that uh, we can address, you know, internet, though it has its own problem. Uh, so it has, you know, uh, fragmented um, here and there. So I think in Ethiopian case, the, the government also, you know, have the priority for the ICT, 
so the ICT sector should be developed if we have, you know, a kind of uh, infrastructure which has, you know, a kind of uh, positive implication to address those remote areas that are not yet uh, got the internet and uh, connection. But the problem uh, with the fragmentation is not the only the issue of, uh, you know, infrastructure. It is the issue of applicability and uh, it is the issue of uh, the operability, okay? When you see the operational aspect of it, it is not as such efficient and uh, as such efficient. Uh, it's, it's, it's agreed because of the uh, conditions, you know, the internet accessibility is not as such uh, good. But there has to be, you know, a kind of uh, national strategies and protocols uh, to be devised and adopted to apply, you know, a kind of rules to uh, control, you know, the misinformation and uh, um, uh, to control the biasness of the citizens not to reach, you know, um, uh, unexpected decisions. So that's a very important point that I want to uh, articulate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wakwadubna. Uh, Dr. Ik Chen, please, your final remarks. Yeah, I think there's um, three responses for me. The first of all is, like, uh, of course, the local interest is important. Uh, so many countries like South Africa are using the antitrust law, you know, to protect the local uh, industry, which is a valid point. So you can have a policy, industry policy, to protect your local Industries to uh, from the threat of the global you know problems, and the, the, so the other thing that I want to mention is that uh, because uh, we all know that the translational nature of the platforms, global platforms. Therefore, the international collaboration is very important, you know. So for, especially for those small country, less developed country. So unless they can join the global uh, regulatory framework, you know, with the help of the developed country and the big players, so to get their voice to be heard and to Cooperate it to in incorporate it into the global regulatory framework. Otherwise, it's very difficult for them to act along. So, therefore, international regulatory collaboration is very important, uh, especially for those uh, uh, develop uh, less developing countries and developing countries. And the, and the, also the second point is about uh, how can we um, manage the uh, international collaborations? I think there's a multi-layer, multi-center, you know, collaboration. So the UN is one of the uh, global like global institutions, but belongs, uh, beyond the uh, UN, there's uh, other, you know, actors can be NGOs, uh, can be at the regional level, local level, you know, even national levels. So we, we will see, you know, th there's a many collaboration mechanism will emerge uh, as simultaneous. In the end, maybe there's a con convergence to some uh, central institution, but we will see. We we'll let everything happen naturally, organically, then maybe in the end we will see something emerge from those interactions. And the last one is about uh, how can we uh, reach out to the local communities. I think uh, many, uh, many like uh, organization or e even WTO are doing like a uh, uh, digital assistance, you know, program to uh, assist uh, African country or the next developed country to uh, increase the, the digital capacities. So these are some programs we're looking at as well. Okay, thank you. That's thank my you very much, Dr. Chen. We can go with Saladin. Thank you, thank you for giving me the floor again. Well, um, I just want to say again that uh, the Global Digital Compact should be considered as uh, a document that uh, guarantees our digital future for a safe and uh, data protected rights of the internet users in this world. Uh, but talking about data rights, let me say that access to internet is considered as a human right and as my friend colleague mentioned from Ethiopia that many still don't have access to internet. Let me say like, how can we declare a human right and we will pay for using, using it or access to this? We are still paying for internet as users. So... Are we now paying for our human rights? Thank you so much. Thank you very much.
Please, let's continue with Milos Jovanovic, if it's possible. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I want to congratulate Ethiopia for organizing this event. So thank you very much once again. Um, my conclusion is related. I will have just three sentences. We should uh, understand how Internet was started, you know, and uh, it was a military project, you know. Uh, it is clear that world historical uh, forces of social economic development shaped, shaped the human history, uh, and the human history um, are full of fragmentation. So, Internet uh, as well, you know. And I don't see that in the near future we will have mechanisms to prevent internet fragmentation because we are en route, we are uh, on the way uh, to building a multipolar world. So now we have many different interests, many different aspects, and I think that uh, we should think about common framework, minimum common framework on internet governance, and that the processes related to internet fragmentation will continue. So our main goal should be to control effectively this and to make internet to stay global network. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, doctor. And uh, well, it's... Uh, Nice way of ending a session with the music band. <laughs> but we have to go to online to Jovan. Please, Jovan, your final remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. When you say we start from left, it triggered me to comment perspectives. You know, your perspective sitting and chair, what is left of me watching here from uh, online. But again, in tradition of three points, uh, let me let make a three points. First one. In a quick, well, Twitter, I don't know these days of Twitter, but let me try to do it. Uh, let's go for a billion instead of next billion, and it relates to comment from our colleague, question from Ethiopia. Uh, maybe money is not shared equally worldwide, but human ingenuity is. And in this bottom billion, we can find definitely great solution and great ideas and great innovation. Therefore, bottom billion instead of next billion. Second point, I would call it grandma geopolitics. Uh, families are connected across the continent. I'm sure from Ethiopia, many there are many people living in the United States. I heard two or three million. Grandmas are connecting with their grandchildren uh, over Skype, WhatsApp other services. Yeah, but there is that citizen drive, push for the internet, in addition to big geopolitics. And it brings me to the third point, is that our decisions from citizens, companies to countries should be guided by interests. And uh, that interest calculation has to be very careful. Sometimes we see the glass half empty, but maybe it is half full. And we should, should just see what can happen if there is disruption and serious fragmentation of the internet to social networks, to grandma geopolitics, to economy, to general well-being of society. Therefore, countries uh, like a company, the citizens will have to make decision. And that decision uh, will be basically the, uh, will be the basis for the future digital social contract. And as we are discussing here, uh, in our session and in the Internet Governance Forum, we are basically starting negotiating global digital social contract. What it will include, we'll see, but it should be driven by uh, informed interest and uh, less clouds, less uh, slogans, less empty rhetoric, but really discussion how Internet impacts citizens, countries, communities and over to you. Thank you very much, Jovan. And we have uh, Mr. B with your, his final remarks. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to mention that, uh, in conclusion, we all understand the need for some common solution and for some common agreement in between countries, people, governments, and so on. But uh, I'd like to raise a problem, not a problem, but I mention that the global IT companies and platforms should be as well recognizable part of this agreement uh, with some obligations to stay neutral and not to intervene any political or internal affairs or any country. 
Thank you very much, Mr. B. Well, we came to the end of this session. It was a fantastic session. Uh, many things to comment about, many things to think about. I would only like to comment about one particular uh, approach regarding sovereignty. I will say that uh, all the work that we've been doing as humanity for several years, trying to reach everyone, trying to reach this universal uh, connection for everyone, and uh, it will be bad if we do actions that actually start splitting the internet, start reducing this kind of uh, ecosystem that we're um, taking advantage of during all these last years, not even because of uh, sovereignty. In some point in the future, maybe we should start thinking about sovereignty of internet itself, like once we start to think about the earth and its rights, it will be something that we need to think in the future. Well, thank you very much for this fantastic session. Thank you for a great panelist that we have today and job and online, and we will see soon. Bye-bye. Finally work. Cheers, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the fan. Yeah. <laughs>